Greetings and welcome to the Monica Cost Show Summer Series, Take the Label Off the Table. I'm your host, Monica Cost. Every week on the Summer Series, we talk to notable personalities and some new faces about the many aspects and challenges of authentic living. Today, I am delighted to have author, serial entrepreneur, and founder of an amazing nonprofit, which we'll hear about a little later, Mr. C.J. Miller. Hello, CJ. Oh, 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 hello. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have finally arrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I will take that. Um, I, you know, as you know, uh, my whole plight, we've been friends for some time now, is around this whole notion of authentic living um, that derived from a lot of different places, but mostly watching people struggle mostly with the labels of society. And so before we get started on that, I just want to hear, you know, I want you to tell the audience a little bit about your story and um, how you arrived to where you are. Oh, um, yeah. I, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a, just a guy who um, realized, you know, I have skills. I went to college, you know, raised in a middle income, low income, more low income um, situation. And um, I just kind of had a moment where I realized, OK, what skills, what skills do I have now? I don't have to go to Barnes and Nobles. I don't have to go enroll in a community college. What what talents, what natural God given abilities do I have now? And, and so out of that, at the time I was living in Dayton, Ohio, where I was going to Wilberforce University, shout out the Wu. Um, and I, I was in the middle of getting a degree in mass media communications. And, you know, several friends had urged me to start modeling. So I modeled for a few years. And then out of that, I um, ended up doing a community based talk show that came on um, late night, like at 2 a.m. or something. But um, I say all of all of that to say um, there was just a moment where doing modeling and working a regular job after I, I graduated with a degree in mass media communications, I just realized, OK, I'm tired of this nine to five daily rep. What can I do? And so I just kind of had this. I, I call it it was, it was nothing but God. I had this idea to quit modeling um, and to um, use the coffee shop environment as a way to kind of catapult myself into the industry that I wanted to get in. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I called my agent and said, hey, um, I'm going to become a barista. I'm going to stop modeling. And he, um, you know, he thought it was admirable, not really the wisest move, but he wished me luck in my endeavors. And uh, long story short, I um, just kind of had an idea to write a, a book using the coffee shop environment called Grind, how to turn your coffee break into your big break. And I do feel like a grind, too, maybe bubbling somewhere. Um, given my uh, recent adventures, but you know that's that's pretty much my my background. Um, yeah, just a person um, that didn't have the machine, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a PR team. I didn't have you know uh, tens of thousands of dollars at my disposal to put together a marketing campaigns. So I figured, you know, why not write a book dealing with getting on television that gives regular folks like myself access to live their dreams and so that's how grind happened and I did reality television and out of that came a lot of other wonderful connections that have resulted in me being um, where I am today and um, starting Fab Five which is an after school book publishing program and writing my own novels. So. Yeah, so I mean I want to I want to back up a little bit to you know interesting I met you on the Tom Joyner cruise when you were actually uh, promoting a reality show that you were on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and, um, um, uh, you know, the show was Amorosa finding the love of her life and you were on that show. But I was really intrigued, you know, after meeting you, one around your sort of your love of God and the passion and the faith that you had. And then also, you know, I love this whole concept of grind how to turn your coffee break into your big break because people often ask about networking and how do you get things done and you actually use the information that you put in your grind book to actually make a lot of different things happen for yourself and right. because this is an authentic living show you know you talked about how your agent 
didn't think it was the wisest move for you to become a barista. Did you have any struggle at that moment between what people might think of you versus what you thought you needed to do for your career? Um, you know, no. I've, I've always been a person. Um, I believe life is designed to be lived from that authentic place, as you, as you put it. Um, and there really are no instructions to do that. You, it, it's more of an intuitive thing. You know what you're good at, and there's kind of like this deep calling. So for me, no, um, I didn't care what anybody said, to be honest. Um, this is something I was doing, and I'm the type of person, the more you root against me, it only adds fuel to the, to the fire. So fast forward then to being on the reality show. So you have this, you know, in addition to the talk shows that you were on and things before that, you know, this was a, a stent of PR and talk shows and all this media. And did people have expectations of you being on television to sort of continue in that vein? And at that point, did you have any struggles around you know, kind of what you wanted to do versus what the expectations were? You know, that's a very, very brilliant question. Um, when you do any sort of media or television, especially reality television, you have to know who you are. Because to your point, yes, there were folks who figured, oh, he's good looking, he's charismatic, oh, you know, he's, he's uh, gonna go on to have this long career in either reality or maybe even television. And for me personally, um, I, I understand all of the positive elements of television and I understand all the not so positive elements of a television. Mm -hmm. And for me, my goal when I did the ultimate merger was I had my agenda and I knew the producers and Amarosa and everyone involved had their agenda. Sure. So it's really when I think about living an authentic life um, and seizing that, that opportunity, I just kind of said to myself, you know what? This is going to be four, four to six weeks of your life standing in Vegas with a group of guys. I'll be sure among of them, uh, Ray, Ray Lavender and a few other people. What is your your strategy? And my strategy was I understood there are going to be times throughout this journey where I am Geppetto, and there are times when I am Pinocchio. <laughs> right. And so my job was okay. How can I leverage this PR machine? You know, I know I'm going to be on commercials. I know there's going to be all of those associations. So it was, you know, it, I I looked at it as a business opp opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if if that makes any sense, and I I hope I answered your your question because there's so much I can say about reality. Like I feel like I can write a I, I feel like I, I can teach a course on um, reality television one on one after doing like I think I've done I don't know twelve or thirteen. Yeah, and you know what? I, I do want to stay on that for a moment because even, I think, just from how long ago? Was that three or four years ago at this point? Um, the ultimate merger was 2011, I believe. Okay, yeah, so three years ago. And you, I mean, reality TV has changed so much even in that amount of time. Would you agree? Oh, goodness, absolutely. And so... Had I had I had I had my moment then, I probably have a reoccur. I probably have my own show by now because there was so much happening. Um, I, I I don't think. I think when I did reality, that reality industry as a whole, they were just they were really starting. They were really in the beginning stages of awakening to the multiple brands that can come from one show and how to monetize that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they even knew like, oh wow, we have these big personalities. Um, these, each one of these individuals represents a potential brand and household name impact. I don't think they really knew that at that time. So, mm -hmm. And that could just be my, my um, authentic ego talk. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so when you look at reality TV today and for any of the personalities that you know are on there, do you think there is a huge divide between that authentic personality versus who you see on television? Oh my goodness, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there was one cameraman, we, we were down, they were changing batteries, and he said, he said to me, you know, CJ, no one can hold their stomach in forever. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And he said, when you're filming reality, everybody the first couple of days are trying to be on their best behavior and be this perfect person, but with cameras rolling 24 hours a day for the next however many weeks, we're going to get whatever footage we want. Sure. 
So, you know, we're going to get a host of footage. So if your character is you're supposed to be the jerk, okay, yeah, we have plenty of footage of you being a good guy. But we're going to use only the small jerk sound bites because that's the character that we have pegged for you. So if you are just a viewer of reality television and you have never been on that side, you're, it's, it's easy to um, emotionally manipulate you in regards to this certain person. So I can make this person seem like a really, I can make this person seem like a monster, although he or she may be an angel. Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I really want people to understand that part of it is that it is, you know, reality slash manipulated TV. <laughs> and so when it's, he, you it know, is, it is what I call pimping <laughs> in the greatest form of pimping. Because you disrupt these regular people's lives. Sure. You put them into this machine of PR and makeup and, you know, their every, their every need is being catered to from what kind of gum do you want? What sort of energy drink do you drink? Mm -hmm. And you put them in that world for six weeks and they're, you know, that, that whole world, you know, we need you to do PR. You know, we're going to send a plane, a car for you to take you here. And then it stops. Sure. And you have these people who... For the people who drink the Kool-Aid for that moment, they leave their jobs, they put their life on hold, and they do it because that, that little element of hope tells them, you know, this could be your break. Mm -hmm. And But the thing about how to turn your coffee break into your big break was it empowers the reader where you have control as opposed to doing a reality show and the writers and the producers have the control. So now you're at, that, you're at their mercy. Sure. And so... Um, yeah, I mean, like you, it's hard for me to watch them now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when you know the people. And I think that's part of the reason why I want to keep doing this show. And to the degree that I can bring some of the reality personalities at some point onto the show, it'd be awesome for people to get um, some insight into who they really are outside of Absolutely. the cameras. Yeah, which would be awesome. Absolutely. So I want to move now on to, because you, you know, you have much like the last interview I did with Nikki Woods, you have a quilted path. You know, you've one thing, one idea has sort of led you to the next thing. And now you're doing something that is just so fantastic with children. And I don't want to miss talking about Fab Five. So um, tell the audience a little bit about what that is, what you're trying to do and how we can help. Awesome. Well, Fab Five is, uh, is the yeah. The acronym stands for uh, Publishing Hope and Branding A Plus Behavior, and it's an after school book publishing program. So, we piloted the program in Locke High School, which is in Watts, California. Locke, the neighborhood historically is characterized by high levels of crime, unemployment, gang violence. And so, the philosophy of Fab Five is that if we can um, pretty much make authors and teach young people to write fiction books, um, that that would serve as a platform to not only help them deal with some of the stresses and frustrations that they're that they are exposed to, um, but also we teach them, you know, the basics of how to develop a book brand, sure. how to market their brand, how to identify their uh, target market. Um, you know, are they going to write romance, suspense, action? We teach them all the elements. What goes into Act One, Act Two. Act three, how to write phenomenal dialogue. And then um, I then go around to the local businesses within the community, Best Buy, 7-Eleven, pretty much whoever was in the, who, what, whichever company is within a five mile radius. Um, and I educate the business owners and say, hey, these are our students. This is the organization that we represent. And the best way you can help these kids and really disrupt that cycle of violence is by carrying their their, their books. So all of our authors, they receive a, um, we bring in a um, professional photographer. They have a couple of different photo shoots. Uh, we, they, they get a publishing contract. They get royalties. We set up a book tour just for them. Um, and our goal is to always have what, what um, we call book signing concerts in non-traditional book venues. So we, we just came off of our uh, summer book tour. We closed it out at the Compton Best Best Buy. Um, it was a great tour. The kids had a great time, and um, I guess I can sum up the entire experience for me. When you see the tears in the eyes of kids who are 16 and 17, and you know they've dealt with very adult issues that young people should not have to deal with, such as rape, 
um, molestation, um, you know, having to be the breadwinner and the student in the 11th or 12th grade, that's a lot to, to deal with. So to see tears in the eyes of those kids as they give their first autograph, and I make sure I get the first autograph, by the way, <laughs> um, it's, I don't really have words to really express just how um, just, just awesome it is. Excellent. Well, thank you so very much. This conversation is getting good. If you would, I would love to have you on for part two of this conversation. Would you be open to that? Of course, because you know, we definitely have to talk about um, all of these relationship issues out here. Excellent. So we are going to end this segment and please join us for part two, which will follow immediately after part one. My name is Monica Koss. This is the Monica Koss Show. Take the label off the table. And until next time, dig in. Join us for part two.